Thank you, Dr. Henderson. We move now to our final speaker this evening, Tom Harwood. Tom is a journalist and political commentator currently working as the deputy political editor of GB News. He has written for The Telegraph, The New Statesman and The Mail, as well as having appeared on flagship programmes from Newsnight to Question Time. He also served as president of our sister society in Durham. Tom, you have the floor. Thank you so much for a very warm welcome and thank you, Mr. President, for inviting me. I have to say, six years ago, I was invited to this chamber to debate a motion that might sound antithetical to this one. Indeed, I was arguing in favour of tuition fees. Now, having successfully annoyed one age cohort that evening six years ago, I thought it only fair to come back and finish the job. <laughs> I thought it only fair to come back and besmirch the value of just about every other age cohort because I'm all about equal opportunity besmirchment. <laughs> now, I might take this opportunity to wonder if the tech is working fine. I hear some squiddles. <laughs> Gladly. Okie doke. Now, I want to start this evening by doing something that I think has not been done enough, and that is remember the motion. What does the motion actually say this evening? This house would respect our elders. Not this house thinks the young people are better than old people. Not that this house would besmirch our elders, much to the contrary to what I said earlier. This is about whether or not we would have innate, unassuming respect for people we have never met. That is what I'm arguing against this evening. But before we get to the substance of the argument, I'd like to come to some of the uh, pro propositions that we've heard this evening. Firstly, the myth that Dr Bristow referred to, a myth that people who are of pension age are getting more than their fair share. Now, aside from the fact that fair share is a nebulous term, something that is used in politics when people want to avoid substance and numbers, what it actually gets to the question of is how much did people put in versus how much are people getting out? When the state pension was founded in 1948, was it a contributory system? Was it a system built so that what you put in is what you get out at the end of the day, perhaps with a little interest? No. As it has been referred to earlier in this debate, it was a Ponzi scheme. It relies upon people currently in work paying for those who have left work. It's so that the Attlee government could get it in straight away, try and suck up some of those votes. Not that it worked that well in 1950 and 51 when he lost the elections. But, um, but crucially, crucially what we saw was a system that relies on taking from one group and giving to another. Now that might work when your population pyramid is looking healthy. But my friends, we are seeing the dependency ratio grow and grow. And what does that mean? A more squeezed younger generation to benefit an elder generation. Now, that's not the fault of those who are receiving those benefits. It's the fault of those who set up the system. But it does create some of those inequalities. We also heard from Dr Bristow that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's true, giants like Sir Isaac Newton, a man of, the, of this realm. Uh, of this university. Now, he was 19 years old when he developed calculus. We didn't hear that bit. He wasn't an elderly man that was respected. No, he was a young man. And so often, some of those initial dis uh, discoveries, some of those initial foundational points of mathematics, points of progress, were done by young people. Uh, Mr Pascal, at the age of 18, developing the first mechanical calculator, is another example. But I want to come to what Dr Robert Henderson said in his marvellous speech that I think to some extent must have uh, frightened you, Dr Henderson, as you were saying it. To come into this room full of antagonistic, hostile, young 20-somethings. To come into this room of people of dubious moral standing. To come into this room of deceptive and violent young people. To come into this room of people more likely to be criminals. To come into this room, indeed, of people who are even better than you at golden balls. 
I think that that shows a level of bravery, and for that, that is an action uh, for which I think you deserve respect. <laughs> but that, that comes to another fundamental point, doesn't it? It's actions that, reserve, that, de that deserve respect, not the simple act of existing. Judge those by their deeds, not by their creed. And that is a fundamental point in this debate, that we should view people not as groups, not as belonging to collectives, but through their worth in terms of what they have done. And we come to wisdom. Wisdom of the ancients. That's a phrase that we've heard so very much. It's interesting. We don't see many modern societies relying on wisdom of the ancients, the United States accepted. What we do see is that societies before they discovered the scientific method, societies before they jumped upon democracy, relied on systems of respecting elders, of listening to elders, of respecting seniority, and to some extent, respecting senility. <laughs> they relied upon herbal medicine. They relied upon rejection of the scientific method. Indeed, re respecting people simply because they are old is a way of, of delivering your society very little indeed, gladly. Democratic systems still have to function on respecting their longevity. There's no such thing as kind of a revolutionary new radical democratic system that is just is respected automatically. Sir, you are absolutely correct, and if this motion was, this House does not respect the longevity of democratic systems, I would, be on the, I would be on this side of the House. I would say we should respect the longevity of systems, of systems of government. We should respect the longevity of things. We shouldn't respect the longevity of people simply for its sake of being longevity. That way lies madness. I want to come to the other point this evening that the proposition raised, which is that Elderly voters leads to moderation. I have to say, not being from a German-speaking country, I was struggling to follow it at the start. Um, but coming from an Anglospheric country, indeed, following the democratic events that have taken place in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Australia, in many of these different countries, I think that your argument rather falls down, although it might be a thing to bring up in, uh, I, I don't know, the Viennese Union at some point. Um, I, I do think that we have a system that works for older people currently, but I do not think that this generational safety net that was described is particularly relevant. And I don't think that many democratic events that we've seen in the last 30-odd years have relied upon a generational safety net. Now, I want to come to another point that my uh, colleagues in the, in the opposition so ably brought up, and this is the generational settlement that we see today. The idea that respect must run both ways. That's an incredibly important point to listen to. The idea that we've had this proposition of a graduated driving licence, the ban on onshore wind, the housing crisis so ably and dreadfully abetted by those who block new housing, and that has been gone into far more than I could ever go into it. But crucially, what we have seen particularly over the last 13 years is a two-tier style of government. We've seen austerity for anyone under the age of 65, and socialism for anyone over the age of 65. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Look at the ring fence departments. Look at the departments of expenditure where, that saw growth. The NHS, 130 billion spent on it per annum in today's cash, uh, inflation adjusted in 2010, up to 180 billion this year. That's a 40% real terms increase in spending on healthcare. People over the age of 65 have free TV licenses. They have free public transport. They have a winter fuel allowance, even if they happen to live in the Costa del Sol. People over the age of 65 account for the largest chunk of welfare spending. Very often we hear politicians going on about scroungers. We hear politicians wanting to turn the nuts and bolts and turn the screws of those on welfare. The largest chunk of people on welfare is indeed those of pension age. And, crucially, those of pension age, a quarter, as we heard, are millionaire households. Gladly.
Thank you for so ably uh, making your point for the opposition this evening. We have indeed spent more on healthcare as other departments have been frozen in real terms, i.e. have been spent less upon. Uh, now, I'm in my final minute, so I do want to come to the point that I began this evening with, and that's that people should be respected for not who they are, but what they do. And so I think it would be fine to end on an elderly person whom I think should gather great respect. Rosalind Carter died on Sunday. She is someone who basically formed the modern sense of First Lady, came from very little, ended up representing her husband, Jimmy Carter, on uh, overseas visits, sat in on cabinet meetings, formed campaigns on issues way ahead of her time, like mental health. Why did people respect her? Why did people write those uh, wonderful prose about her passing on Sunday? Not because she happens to be old, but because what she did in her marvellous life. And similarly, this is not a speech that is lauding young people for the sake of it. There are plenty of young nimbies. There are plenty of young drains on society. I'll reference just one. A Swedish girl by the name of Greta Thunberg. Now, <laughs> she might be best known for being someone who wants to deliver green energy in the future. Would it surprise you to know that she's been campaigning to tear down, not even stop, but tear down a wind farm in Norway because it was built on indigenous land. Not all young people are yimbies, not all young old people are nimbies, not all young people deserve our respect, not all old people deserve our respect. Treat people as they should be treated, by what they do, by who they are, not by which age cohort they happen to reside in. For opposing this motion tonight. Thank you, Tom. And with that, our debate tonight concludes. Just before we go, though, a couple of things. First of all, uh, this was the last full debate of term, so can we give a quick, warm thank you to Jasper Ossel, our debates officer, for putting on a lovely set of debates. Um, this time next week we have something a little different, um, which we can't announce until 24 hours beforehand, um, but please do be here at 8 o'clock next week. Um, we now move to vote, so could the tellers please take their positions. As you know, in this house we vote with our feet, eyes to the right, nose to the left. Results will be announced in the bar. Can we end with one last thank you to everyone that contributed this evening? <laughs> <laughs>